Thank you for checking out Coastal Community Church. We hope that you receive hope and encouragement through this week's message. If this ministry has impacted your life in any way, please share your story at mystory@coastalcommunity.tv. We hope you enjoy the service. Well, good morning, Pompano. How are you guys doing this morning? Fantastic, fantastic. Hey, my name is TJ. I'm one of the pastors here. We're so glad that you're with us as we're starting this brand new series called Relationship Goals, uh, because I know that all of us have some goals in a relationship, whether you're married and happy, whether you're married and miserable. We all have some goals, whether you're single and, and love the single life, or you're single and you're like, I can't wait to be married, or you're just in the friend zone, and you're, you're cool being in the friend zone, no matter where you are, whether you're a parent, uh, hoping to have kids, I believe that there's going to be some principles over the next couple of weeks that are going to really help take your relationships to another level in life. And so I, I think we're just going to have a great time. I mean, anytime you can start off with some muse and uh, in church, it makes it a better, better Sunday. So uh, Today, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about how do you turn down the drama in your relationships? Anybody ever experienced some relationships with some drama in them? Shayla, put your hand down. You've never experienced drama in our relationship. We've all experienced some drama in our relationships. Uh, Rita Rutner, who's a comedian, she said, there's nothing better than committing to one person that you're going to annoy for the rest of your life. <laughs> nothing better than that. And, and so, you know, there's some annoying things that can take place in relationships. There's a lot of things that people do that happen to annoy people. One of them happens to be toilet paper. You know, toilet paper can be a sense of frustration in a relationship, specifically like which way does the toilet paper go on? Because it's an age-old debate. Does it go over? Does it go under? Like, and, and people people struggle with that. I actually had somebody Facebook me the proper methodology based on the patent. Uh, this morning already. So apparently there's some people very anal about this. You don't want to marry them because you'll be in trouble. Um, and, and then there's some people that are just challenged with toilet paper, like, like this guy. Like, like what's, what's up with that? Like, why can people not put the toilet paper on the toilet paper roll? Amen. Can I get an amen right there? Amen. Like, people that, that do this, they're always like, well, well, it only takes five seconds to put it on. And they're like, well, if it only takes five seconds, then you do it. I'm like, I'm going to punch you in the face is what I'm going to do. And, and at our offices, we kind of struggle with this for a while. And so Shayla got a sign for all the guys in our office to help them. Changing the toilet paper will not cause brain damage. Just FYI, in case you are wondering if, if it might impact you greatly. Another thing that causes a lot of frustration is the air conditioner in a home. An air conditioner can cause a lot of problems. How many of you guys are always hot? You're always hot. Yeah, so a couple of people. How many of you guys are always cold? Always cold people? There's some always cold people. Yeah, it, usually you're married to the opposite. And so in our household, we're constantly over this. Shayla's typically uh, likes it a little bit warmer in the house, and I like it colder. And so we're constantly what I call in the Cold War. You know, just, just fighting over the AC unit and what the temp is going to be. Another one that's a, a big fight is, is the car radio. Who's in charge of the car radio? Who's in charge of the playlist? How many of y'all think it's the driver? Think it's the driver's in charge of car radio? How many think it's the passenger? These are the people that are riding into the car <laughs> all the time. And passenger. How many of y'all know it's the kids that are in charge of the radio? Yeah. Barney is ruling the radio. So there's a lot of frustration that's out there. There's a lot of different things that we wrestle with. And I love what Rodney Dangerfield said. He said, my wife and I were happy for 20 years, and then we got married. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, all you got to do is look around at life and look around at relationships and the dynamics that are going on in relationships and 
the, the struggles that are happening in relationships. Maybe it's a struggle that you're in a relationship right now with. Maybe it's a struggle that you've seen in your parents' relationship or in friendships. And it's really easy to get cynical about relationships. And you just you start to ask questions of like, man, is it ever possible to have peace? Is it ever possible to have purpose? Is it possible that, that there can be meaning and intentionality in relationships? And when you see the struggles, it's, it's hard to see the intentionality there. It's difficult in those moments. And then the Bible comes along and says, you know what? Uh, there is some purpose and there is joy and there is meaning and there is significance in relationships when you put God at the center of it. And so while we have a lot of questions about is that really true, and I think it's one of the reasons why as a whole in society that we're waiting a lot longer to make a commitment in relationships is because we've lost hope in the fact that there can be joy, peace, meaning, and significance, and purpose in those relationships. But I really do believe that in God's word, there's a lot of hope for us. There's a lot of meaning, there's a lot of peace, and there's a lot of significance that can come out of relationships. And we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 5 today, and we're going to be looking at some words that the Apostle Paul wrote when he was referring to marriage and relationships that I think will be really, really helpful for any of those that are in relationships, want to be in relationships at some point in time. This is what he says in chapter 5, verse 31. It says, as scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united. And he's quoting Genesis there, the first book of the Bible. He's just saying, hey, this is from the very beginning. He continues on. He says, this is a great mystery. And if you've ever been in a relationship, you know that a relationships are just a mystery. Like, they make no sense. You try to figure out the other person, you can never figure that person out. Men can never figure out women. Women, like, there's a good chance you'll figure us out. And we're, we're just simple. You make us more complicated than we really are. And so he continues on. But it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. And so what he's saying is, is, that marriage and relationships aren't just something that's thrust onto us by society and that we just have to deal with and wonder, am I, is there ever going to be any happiness and peace out of this? But what he's saying is, is that there, there is a bigger aspect to it. And marriage and deep relationships, the Bible says, are a correlation. They look significant to the same way that Jesus and the church interacted. Like their correlation is the same. The same way that Jesus loved the church and loved people is the same way that we should love other people as well. And, and in this passage that we're going to continue to read, Paul is going to give us some insight into some principles that I believe that if we can apply them in our relationships, we'll totally transform the dynamics of those relationships. And if you're taking notes, the first one is this, is we have got to remember in relationships that we are on the same team. We have got to remember that we are on the same team. We're on the same team, whether that's a marriage relationship, whether that's a family dynamic, whether that's with a coworker in a friendship, that, that we've got to remember that we are on the same team. In other words, we want the same things for the majority of the time out of that relationship. And so what that does is that helps to cut down on the drama in the relationship when we keep in mind that we're on the same team. It'll make us cut down on the arguing and the bitterness and the pettiness and the throwing of things and all the drama that arises when we keep our eyes focused that we're on the same team. See, the only time that the drama starts to elevate in life and that the, the, the emotions start elevating is when we forget that we're on the same team. We start putting our focus on other things that, rather than remembering that we're on the same team. It's kind of like this couple that recently went to New York Knicks basketball game and they forgot that they were on the same team and check out what happens. So we got the kiss cam going on. She's excited. He's texting. He's ignoring her. And he's not ignoring her. <laughs> but isn't that true? Like when, when we start to ne neglect the relationship and we forget that we're on the same team, all of a sudden we get caught up in other things and all of a sudden the emotions start running high and we start making deci decisions that are going to be detrimental to that relationship. I know the reality is, is that if we all had a kiss cam on our life through all the moments of our life, how many of us would have some pretty terrible moments? 
We all would because we all get focused on the wrong things. We get, I know that I would be the guy that's texting and miss out on these divine moments with my wife and, and it would stir up emotion and all of a sudden conflict would arise just like it did there. And we've got to remember that we're on the same team. Jeff and Shanti Feldman, who are, are some authors and have done a lot of studying on, on marriage relationships, they've actually done a lot of work with couples that are in crisis mode in their relationship and are going through deeply troubled times. Um, as they were studying these couples, they started asking them this question. And the question was, is, do you love and care deeply for the person you're in a relationship with? And when they asked that the question to people that were in troubled relationships, 98% of them said, yes, man, I, I, I deeply care and love the other person. Now, when they continued and they asked them this question, they said, do, do you believe that the other person that you're in a relationship deeply loves and cares for you? 58% of them said, yes, I believe that, which meant that there was a 40% change discrepancy. 98% said, man, I deeply love and care for the other person. 40% less thought the other person deeply cared and loved them. And, and so all of a sudden it goes, what, where, where is the breakdown happening? And I think the breakdown happens when we forget that the other person that we're in a relationship with, that we're on the same team as them, that typically we want the same things. And so they continued on and they asked, they asked a really interesting question to these couples. They said, what is one thing that you wish your spouse knew? And for the vast majority of men, they wish that their wife knew that they deeply loved them. And then they asked the same question, question to the wives, and the wives responded for the vast majority of them, the overarching, they, a lot of them responded that, that he would know that he is my hero. And these are, these are couples that are in struggling, difficult relationships, and yet there is this acknowledgement that we are on the same team. There is this, this realization that, man, if we can focus on the fact that we're on the same team, that maybe, just maybe, there's some way that we can get through this. And what happens for a lot of us is, is when we're in these relationships, whether it's a marriage relationship, whether it's a family dynamic, whether it's a parenting thing, whether, whether it's a deep friendship, we forget that we're on the same team and all of a sudden there's conflict that arises and that conflict starts escalating and starts causing all kinds of problems in the relationship. And what's interesting is, is one of the top uh, psychologists and relational experts and counselor named Joel Murphy he was studying this, and he said, on average, somebody that's having a, a physical difficulty, like let's say like a, a heart problem, if they start having some heart issues, within six days, they will be at the doctor or be at the hospital within six days if they start having a heart issue. At the same point, in a relationship, when people start having relationship issues, they will wait on average six years before they seek help. So when you have heart issues, a physical problem, within six days, you'll be getting somebody to check that out. But when you have a heart issue, when it comes to relationships, you'll wait up to six years to try to fix that problem. What that tells me is the reason why we have so much divorce and so much brokenness and so much hurt in our society is because we're not seeking help soon enough. We're ignoring the problems and we're ignoring the fact that we're on the same team and we both want the same things and we need to just sometimes ask somebody else for some help in life. And for some of us today, that's what we need to do. We need to seek out some help. We need to say, you know what? Well, there, there, there's some dynamics that are going on that we haven't been able to figure out and while we're on the same team, there's some brokenness, there's some trouble, there's some difficulty. We need help. And if, if that's you today, man, as a church, we want to help. Man, fill out that info card and say, man, I, I need some help. And we want to get you connected with some people that can help you. Maybe you need to go see a Christian counselor. We know some great ones. We'd love to get you connected up with them. And I know some of you guys, all of a sudden, you're starting to push back and going, well, well, I can't afford to go see a Christian counselor. Listen, you can't afford not to. That divorce is going to be a whole lot more costly than that Christian counseling, both financially and emotionally. Go get some help today. And I don't care where you are. If you're just struggling in relationships, get some help. We want to help you. Don't try to do this alone. You don't have to. Man, we are on the same team. We want the same thing for you as you want for you. 
And so Paul is challenging us to remember that we're on the same team, and he's, he's going to continue on to, to challenge us to show love and respect to each other. In verse 33, he says this, So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. And, and this verse right here is so rich because Paul is alluding to something that is very, very gender specific. And he's saying, listen, for the vast majority of us, we're going to fall into these categories. There might be a couple of us that, that this isn't necessarily the case for, but, but for the majority of us, here's how it's going to roll. What he's saying is, is, he's saying, listen, the primary need for women in a relationship is they need to feel loved. That's their primary need. Now, for men, their primary need in a relationship is they need to feel respected. There is a difference between those two. And he's saying, listen, this isn't something you need to glance over, but this is something we need to hone in and look at and dig a little bit deeper. And so, guys, my challenge for you as men is I want to encourage you to show her love in the relationship. I want to encourage you to show her love in the relationship. Verse 25 says this, for husbands... This means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. That's a pretty high mark for us, guys. That's the standard that he's setting for us. He says, he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one ever hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church, and we are members of his body. So guys, here's the challenge. The challenge for us is to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Well, how did Christ love the church? And Paul alludes to a couple of ways that Christ showed love to the church. The first way is, is one of the ways is that he was committed to the church. Christ was committed to the church. He came, uh, he, was, he was eternally existing in heaven. He saw the need and the brokenness here on earth. He came to earth, he walked, he talked, he taught, he lived. He eventually was crucified for our sin, our shame, and our pain. He paid the ultimate price there on the cross and rose again. And throughout his life, he said things like, I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you, alluding to commitment. He said, uh, I'll be with you to the end of the age, alluding to commitment. And so Christ was continually expressing this idea of commitment to the church, signifying that as guys, we should be continually expressing our commitment to the women in our lives. And so he's saying, listen, you need to make sure that she knows that you're committed. So that, that means, dude, if you're out there and you've been dating for six years, you need to maybe start thinking a little bit more about the commitment level. You need to start listening a little bit more to Beyonce. If you liked it, you should have put a ring on it. <laughs> and instead of should have put a ring on it, put a ring on it. Show some commitment. And that commitment is going to speak so much because it's a powerful statement. Listen, this is powerful. When you say, listen, I'm committed for better or for worse. Listen, I'm committed no matter how good it is or how bad it is. Like, I'm with you till the end. That says a lot to somebody. That expresses a lot of love in a relationship. Another thing that Jesus does in loving the church is Jesus exemplifies sacrifice in a relationship. He exemplifies this sacrifice. He says, man, I'll lay down my life for the church. And men, we're to be the kind of people that would be willing to lay down our lives for those we love and we care about. Part of the process of moving from being a boy to a man is learning to sacrifice in relationships. You know, one of the things that I'm, I, 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 I learned the most from my stepdad who was in Vietnam is, is he taught me a couple things about sacrifice. He said, you sacrifice for your country and you sacrifice for your family. That's how you become a man. He would tell me that when I was a kid, and he, he would in, imply that importance. And I saw that play out in his life. I saw him sacrifice in his work ethic, in his time. He'd get up early. He'd be out late. He would sacrifice food. He would sacrifice in all different arenas of life so that we could have things that we would never have because of his sacrifice. And men, we need to be willing to do whatever it takes to sacrifice to show our wives, to show the people we love and care about that they're important in our life because Jesus showed that same sacrifice. He gave it all up on the cross, signifying the sacrifice that he was willing to make to express his love to all of us. 
Another way that Jesus modeled love is he modeled it through communication. It says that he gave up his life to make her holy and clean by washing her, by cleansing of God's word. In other words, he communicated God's word through who he was and the words that he was speaking to people about who they could be. And it's a challenge for all of us to communicate our love and care to those that are most important in our lives. He's, he's saying, listen, you're going to have this commitment to communication. And men, this is critical for us. Because study after study after study shows that a woman's uh, self-esteem and worth and value is disproportionately derived from the most significant male relationship in her life. And so a woman's confidence, her value that she sees in herself is coming from the most significant male relationship in her life. And so that, that's huge. You got to realize that the words that you're speaking in a relationship, whether you're a husband or you're a father, because this applies men to your daughters, you're going to have the most significant voice in shaping her value and her worth. And, and listen, there's a lot of voices out there telling women what they're not. There's a lot of voices out there saying, man, you're not pretty enough. You're not tall enough. You're not short enough. You're not athletic enough. You're not uh, petite enough. You're not smart enough. You're not agile enough. There's all these things. And we need to be the voice that buffers all of that noise out and says, this is who you are. And this is where your value comes from. And here's your worth. And you're better than that. And you've got good gifts. And you've got talent. And I love you. And you're beautiful. And you're significant. And you're loved. And you're valued. They need to hear that from you. If you don't like the image your spouse has of herself, check out yourself. If you don't think that she loves herself, it's probably because you're not loving her with your words. Hello. Hello. Because what you communicate has a significant impact. And listen, I don't want someday my wife or someday when I have kids, my daughter, finding her worth and value from somebody else's words because she's getting more than enough from me. Husbands, you don't want your wife or your daughters finding their value and worth from some boy that's texting them or some man that's at work that's giving them compliments because you're not giving them compliments at home. Man, the way we communicate is significant in the value and the worth that they, they, they have and the love that they receive. And it's important that we communicate love. It's one of the reasons why I think The Five Love Languages by Dr. Gary Chapman is one of the best books ever written. It, it talks about how we show love to one another. And he says there's five ways that we show love. He show, we show love through acts of kindness. We show love through quality time. We show love through gifts. We show love through words of affirmation. We show love through physical touch. That doesn't mean sex. That means like holding hands, hugs. It can mean sex. But there's five different ways that we show love. And so my challenge to all of us as men, as women, is, is find out the way that your spouse or the relationships that you have, what are the ways that they receive love? Because a lot of us in relationships, we're flying blind right now. We think that we're loving them really well, but they're not getting any love that we're receiving. For a long time in Shayla and I's relationship, when we first started dating, I was bringing Sh Shayla flowers like every day. Like uh, every day, like flowers were showing up at her work. I'd have old people bring them in. She worked at a doctor's office. And so there's these older people that would come in with flowers. They'd be like, these are for Shayna because they could never say her name. And, uh, and she'd go out to her car. There'd be flowers out there because I saw in a movie somewhere that girl, like show, how you show love to women is you give them flowers. And so, man, I was breaking the bank giving Shayla flowers until one day she's like, you know what? flowers aren't really that important to me. I'm like, what? Freaking going broke here. Should have been a florist. And, and like, because I was trying to show her love in a way that I thought that she received love, but that isn't how she receives love. In fact, I'll never forget when we had uh, bought a house about 10 years ago um, and, and Shayla had gone on this women's retreat. And while she was gone, I thought to myself, you know what? We just got this house. I'm going to clean it up. I'm going to get everything organized. And so I went and I cleaned up the kitchen and got the, the living room straightened out. I got the bedroom straightened out. And I decided, man, my wife loves shoes. I'm going to build these shoe racks and all these closet things. And like our master bedroom closet is going to be dynamite. Like she's going she's gonna to be so excited when she sees this. And I remember she got back 
that Sunday night from the retreat, and I met her at the door, like just waiting for her, like a like a giddy puppy at the front door, just like wanted to show off everything I did. I was like, I was like walking her through the house. I'm like, you see the kitchen here? You see how clean it is? Look, look, the glasses are right next to the refrigerator where it makes sense. And and then we walked in the living room, and I, we went in the bedroom, and all of a sudden I'm thinking brown chicken, brown cow right there, brown chicken, brown wow. You know, we're gonna go. I show her the master bedroom closet, and I'm thinking score and she's like tj that's great but it's been a long week and can i just sit down on the couch and and talk and i'm like yeah we can go sit down on the couch and talk about how freaking awesome i am (laughs) and how clean this house is (laughs) see shayla didn't give a rip about any of the stuff i did i mean she's like that's nice but i received love through acts of service and so i was doing what i received love in The way that Shayla receives love is she receives love through quality time. So what she wants me to do is block out an hour of my schedule and sit there on the couch and just stare into her eyes, (laughs) which is kind of creepy to me. But if that's what it takes. And for some of us, what happens is, is what we're laying down, they ain't picking up. We think, we think, man, I'm so smooth. I'm showing so much love. And and they're not even that it's, it's not even correlating with them. And sometimes we got to realize, man, what, how are we expressing love to them? And it's important that we find that out and then, guys, take that and put it in your wallet. So the next time you're thinking, man, I'm going to show her love, don't go out and buy her a fishing rod. Take out the game plan that she gave you and of telling you, this is how I receive love and do something from that. And so, guys, we have got to show her love. And then, girls, ladies, you've got to show him respect in the relationship. Ladies, you got to show him respect. This is what it says in Ephesians 5, verse 21. It says, And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as the Lord. Now, let me just stop right there because this is a passage of Scripture that gets misquoted all the time. Guys, they, they hear this and they go, Hey, babe, I heard somewhere in the Bible that it says you're supposed to submit to me. Go get me some Doritos. You know, and you better submit. And they don't like quoting the first part of that scripture. Because the first part of the scripture says, and further, submit to one another. What? That doesn't mean it's just like you serve me. No, no, no. What it means is that there is this mutual submission that's got to be happening. There's got to be this, like, hey, I'm going to take care of you. You're going to take care of me. We're going we're gonna to help each other out. It's not just a one-way street like a lot of guys think it is. It continues on. For the husband is the head of the wife. As Christ is the head of the church, he is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to your husbands in everything. And listen, I've never known a woman that has struggled to submit to her husband when she knows that that guy is dying for her like Christ died for the church. No woman has any problems following her man when she knows that that man has the best of intentions for their family at the forefront of every decision. And he's not being selfish and he's not being immature. It's an important element. So why does the Bible talk about women need to be under the authority of the guy? And I think the reason the Bible talks about that because there is this deep down wired need inside of every guy to be respected. Like, it is this core need that every guy has. In fact, a, a whole bunch of studies that I, I saw were talking about couples that were in arguments. And as the argument started getting elevated, because the argument is never really about the argument. It's always about something else. They said as the argument started to elevate, uh, they started asking guys, do you feel like you're not loved in this argument? Or do you feel like you're being disrespected in this argument? What is the reason you keep elevating the argument? And 81% of the guys said, it's never really about the argument. It's about the disrespect that I feel in the conversation. See, this is a huge need for guys. And I've sat down in so many counseling sessions with husbands and wives. And and what will typically happen is they'll come in and the wife will sit down and say, you know, Pastor TJ, like I absolutely love him. I just don't respect him anymore. And you have no idea what kind of a gut punch that is to every man when they hear that. It would be like flipping the switch and having the guy walk in and you sit there and say, you know what, Pastor TJ, I really respect her, but I don't love her anymore. You'd be like, oh, heck no. Like that ain't right. But yet so many times 
That's exactly the outlook. And women often think, they think, listen, I will respect him when he becomes respectable. When he becomes respectable, that's when I'll give him the respect that he deserves. But if we were to flip that script and go, hey, you know what? Guys would say, listen, I'll love her when she becomes lovable and does this, this, and this. Then she's worthy of my love. Like nobody's going to go, that's okay. But for some reason, we think that we should love unconditionally, but respect is something that needs to be earned. And the reason we think that is because that's what happens in the business world. But have you ever noticed what happens in the business world doesn't really elevate relationships most of the time? Like what works in business doesn't really work in your house. And if you try to run your house like a business, like your business is going bankrupt. But yet that's what so many of us do. We think, well, when they earn the respect, and let me just submit to you, let me just challenge you. I believe that we have to love unconditionally, and we also have to submit unconditionally. If we are going to have healthy relationships in our homes. So what, what does that look like? How do we do that? And I, I, I would challenge you, ladies. I would, I would challenge you to sit down and ask the men in your life, what is it that I do that makes you feel respected? Just ask them that question. Just like the guys are going to ask you the question of, how do I express love to you? Because women are really good at expressing love through communication. They're really good at saying, like, I love you. But here's what you're missing on the I love you part, because guys don't really care about I love you. I'm just going to be honest uh, for the vast majority. We, we like I love you and I respect you. I love you and it's the and part that's really significant for us. Like, I love you and I love the way you take care of our cars. I love you and I love the way you yell at refs at our kids' ball games. Like, they, like they need that and part because that and part is the thing that's going to bring the most meaning to the conversation. That's where they're going to find that respect and that value out of the relationship. Whereas on the flip side, you need the respect and the, the value you find in the love part, how they're communicating that to you. So what's, what are some other ways that you can show respect? Just go do something that your guy likes. Go with him to play golf with him, even though you think it's a stupid game of hitting a white little ball. That dude will, we, like, he'll feel so respected because you care about the things that he cares about. I think another way, if you really want to show respect to your husband, here's the best way or a guy in your life. The next time that he's out doing some yard work or mowing the yard, here's what I want you to do, ladies. I want you to go into your garage and grab a, a lawn chair and walk out and just set it out in the front yard, grab an iced tea and just go sit down in that yard chair and watch your man mow the yard. Just watch him. Just sip that iced tea and go, that's my man mowing the yard. And here's what's going to happen. That dude, he's out there. He's got all kinds of things going on in his mind. He's just, he's just pushing the lawnmower. He's like, man, I got to mow the yard. I got to mow the yard. Slumped over, and he's mowing the yard, and he's thinking, man, I got to wash the, wash the cars after this, and I got to go do this, and I got to go do that, and I got to do this, and I got to do that. And, 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 and he's going to look up at some point, and he's going to see you over there looking at him. And here's the deal. I want you to look at him like the way you used to look at him. Y'all remember what that was like, the way that you used to when you first got together, when you had those googly eyes? Look at him that way. He's going to look up. He's going to see you looking at him, and he's going to go, what's wrong? <laughs> and you're just going to sit back, sipping your tea, and you're going to go, ain't nothing wrong, but everything's all right, and just wink at him. Just wink at him. I'm telling you, I'm telling you right now, you wink at him, you're going to see him. He's going to be pushing that lawnmower, and while he might be middle-aged, he might be middle around the waist, he might be middle around the hairline, you're going to start to see all of a sudden he's going to get a little pep in his step. He's going to start pushing that mower a little bit harder. All of a sudden, you're going to see that bicep start flexing, gripping that lawnmower, just like, check this out. And as he's going along, he's going to get to the edge, and he's going to do like a little trick for you and spin the lawnmower kind of show off the booty a little bit and come back. And you're just going to be staring at him the, other, the whole time, just smiling, just smiling and sipping. And here's what's going on. Here's what's happening in that scenario. That guy, what's going on in his mind is he's going, I still got it. Listen, he, that's exactly what's happening in his mind. He's going, I still got it. I might be a little bit rounder. I might be a little bit more middle-aged. I might be a little bit shorter. I might be balding a little bit, but I 
still got it. And what you're communicating to him is that, man, listen, you might, things might have changed physically. Listen, things might have changed financially, but you're still my man. And I love you, and I respect you, and you still got it for me. Because just like every woman out there is receiving all these things, telling them what they're not, every man is hearing messages externally and internally. And the one question that they're wondering about is, do I still got it? And the only person's answer that matters, honestly, is yours. They don't care if the lady down the street thinks he has it. They don't care about his mom still thinks he has it. All they care about is, do you still think he's got it? And what happens for a lot of us is we just forget that we're on the same team. And what happens when we forget that we're on the same team is we stop loving unconditionally. We stop respecting unconditionally. And the reason why is because relationships are messy. And the reason relationships are messy is because we got two broken people coming together trying to make something whole. And two broken things never make something right. They never make it whole. But the one thing that does turn broken things into something whole is Jesus. The one thing that does pick up the pieces in the mess of life is Jesus. Paul is saying all throughout scripture here that when we really we put our focus on acting the way that Christ would have us act in life we put our focus on serving and loving and respecting in an unconditional manner in the same manner that Jesus did it changes everything because when we're each one of us is on each side and we're, we're heading our own directions and all of a sudden we realize we're on the same team. You know where we start to unite at? We start to unite at the cross where everything changes. And maybe today you're here and you're in a relationship and it's a struggle. There's some brokenness that's happening. Maybe you're here and you're single and you're single because you feel like you've been broken. you feel unlovable or where you can find healing and where you can find hope today the first place you can find it is at the cross the cross where Jesus sacrificed everything so you could have life and have it more abundantly you don't have to settle for status quo but I believe that God has got so much more for you and he wants to do a healing and he wants to do a restorative work in your life here today. Thank you for checking out Coastal Community Church. We hope that you receive hope and encouragement through this week's message. If this ministry has impacted your life in any way, please share your story at mystory at coastalcommunity.tv. We hope you enjoy the service.